Good evening, I'm Lydia Lunch, and Mark Cunningham was in one of the most influential no-wave bands, at least in my opinion, called Mars. It was one of four bands that was on the seminal, I like to say seminal, album, <laughs> No New York. Uh, as a 17-year-old runaway, when I saw Mars, which was one of the most psychotic bands, I think, that has ever produced music, it was so inspirational to me because everything that had inspired me before uh, was too traditional. I'm going to read a little piece about my views of why and what No Wave was. But if you have never heard the music of Mars, and this is not indicative at all, I do urge you to investigate because you will hear nothing more psychotic probably ever in your life. Thank you. I hit Manhattan as a teen terror in 1976, inspired by the manic ravings of Lester Bangs and Cream Magazine, the Velvet Underground sarcastic wit, the glamour of the New York Dolls' first album, and the poetic scat of her only good record, in my opinion, Piss Factory by Patti Smith. I snuck on my bedroom window, jumped on a Greyhound bus, and crash-landed in a bigger ghetto than the one I had just escaped from, but with 200 bucks in my back pocket and a notebook full of misanthropic rantings and sporting a baby face which belied a hustler's instinct and a killer urge to destroy everything that had inspired me, I really didn't give a flying fuck if the Bowery smelled like dog shit. I wasn't expecting the toilets at CBGB's to be the bookend to Duchamp's urinals, but then again, maybe 1977 had more in common with 1917 than anyone would have imagined. Now, New York City during the late 1970s and early 80s was a beautifully ravaged slag, impoverished and neglected after suffering from decades of abuse and battery. She stunk of sex, drugs, and aerosol paint. Her breath hung heavy, a sweet tubercular, sticky and viscous. She leaked from every pore like a sexy corpse, unable to give up the ghost. It was like a succubus that fed on new meat and fresh blood who in turn suckled on her like greedy parasites, alchemizing her putrefaction into a breeding ground of intoxicating fauna. A contaminated nursery overrun with toxic belladonna, a deadly nightshade whose blossoms mocked death by embracing a life which defied death, which in turn mocked just about everything else. Now long before the Family-friendly, gentrification capital gains, criminality, whitewashed New York City of all its kaleidoscopic perversions. In order to make it safe for anyone who could afford the ridiculous rents charged for shoebox-sized apartments, the Lower East Side played crash pad, shooting gallery, and bordello to dozens, maybe dozens of dozens of art school dropouts, avant-noise musicians, radical poets, no-budget filmmakers, and fly-on-the-wall photographers who all lived in glorious squalor in cheap tenement flats spitting distance from each other's front window. It was a drug-fueled, no-holes-barred, blood-soaked pornucopia of art terrorists documenting their personal descent into the bowels of an inferno in a city which felt like the lunatics had taken over the asylum. Creativity acts as a rogue virus, spontaneously combusting, splattering the brain matter of its host carriers across a finite terrain for a fleeting amount of time, but forever staining the landscape. Hippie radicals flocked to hate Asbury during the summer of love, seeking revolution before the acid wore off. Heavyweight Southern African Americans migrated north looking for paid work and ended up singing the blues in Chicago in the 1940s. The devil hollered when he caught his great balls of fire in Memphis throughout the 1950s. The scandalous theatrics and outrageous decadence of the Weimar Republic in the 1920s fostered both an uprise in prostitution and performance art in Germany and made the golden age of Hollywood in the dirty 30s seem quaint by comparison. 
The voice for his orgy that had begun in Andy Warhol's factory in the swinging 60, 60s had become a bloated technicolor corpse kicked to the curb by the gutter punks and no-wave nihilists of the late 1970s whose idea of a good time was defined by how much noise they could make, how much art they could create, and how much trouble they could cause before the cops arrived to close down the after party. Like the anti-art invasion of Dada and the surrealist pranksters who shadowed them who had a blast while pissing all over everybody's expectations of what art was, No Wave was a collective bowel-cleansing caterall which spat forth a collective of extreme artists who defied category, despised convention, defiled the audience, and refused to compromise, and was consequently influenced and informed pop culture as well as mainstream media, if you really fucking pay attention. It's only a movement, in retrospect. Post Alan Vega's pre-punk two-piece approximately and appropriately named Suicide and before pop-punk grunge Sonic Youth, of which Bob Bird, who now plays in Retrovirus, was a one-time part of, New York City was the devil's dirty litter box. No Wave was the bastard offspring of Taxi Driver, Times Square, The Son of Sam, The Blackout of 77, The Dud of the Summer of Love, The Hate Fuck of Charles Manson, The Hell of the Vietnam War, Kent State, The Kennedy Assassinations. It was a mad collective of death-defiant miscreants, de desperate to rebel against the apathetic complacency of a zombie nation, and America is a zombie fucking nation, and it is dumbed down by sitcoms, disco at that time, especially fast food and professional wrestling. Now, yeah, we were angry, we were ugly, we were snouty, we were fucking loud, we used music and art as a battering ram and a form of psychic self-defense against our own naturally violent tendencies, and believe me, I'm still fucking violent, and I still use music as that vehicle to express it. You better thank the fucking gods of music for that. You know, as an extreme reaction against everything that the 1960s had promised but failed to deliver. A collective mania that shot through the night skies of a decade riddled with the aftermath of all the failures and frustrations that had come before it. But beneath the scowls of derision and the antagonism and the acrimony and the beautifully hideous harangues and the nearly unbearable shrill, that grotesque soundtrack, which was indeed the soundtrack of our fucking lives, we were, most of us at least, I was, howling with delight, laughing like lunatics at the bring of the apocalypse in a madhouse the size of all of New York City, thrilled to be rubbing up against the freaks and the outcasts who somehow, for some reason, had decided to all run to Land's End and all at once scream their bloody fucking heads off. And I can't tell you how happy I am to have been alive in that period in New York then because it does not exist anymore. Thank you very much for coming.